Lee. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, profiling of deep learning with Insight Systems, and I'm the Director of Engineering and Platform Tools. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit first about monitoring versus profiling to better understand these, uh, you know, the, the slippery slope between the two. Um, we'll talk then about profiling on a single node, go over the overview of Insight Systems, the basic features and how you might do GPU investigations and even uh, CPU side investigations and features. We'll talk a little bit about common uh, bubble recovery tactics and then uh, time willing, uh, even talk a little bit about then how to scale that up to multi node uh, and you know how that extends off of that single node experience and what you might need to do for your analysis there. So with monitoring versus profiling, uh, they differ in the target users and the intent, right? Which really equals trade-offs in the, the tool's design. And so, you know, obviously you need to pick the right tool for the job and you could try to make either of them work, but you're going to have varying levels of experience and uh, more difficulties potentially in solving one type of problem over the other. So don't expect one to be fully usable for the other. And there's some, you know, gray areas and, uh, you know, in hybrid amalgamations between profilers and uh, monitors. Um, and, and even then there's still usually some trade-offs. Um, so that's kind of the the, the fair warning, since we we do see you know a lot of people jumping up or down the stack and you know too high or too low um, uh, to try to, to to get their work done without maybe realizing what they might be giving up uh, by by doing so. So the monitors are typically more coarsely observing quality utilization, possibly even progress um, through a job. Um, and they can be used for maybe rating an app, you know, an app on how well it might be using the, the node or the whole cluster. Um, and they typically tend to be doing some sort of continual output, maybe not at the highest frequency, usually not, like a, a maybe at like one hertz, uh, so that you can kind of see that status and that utilization of your machine. And, and this tends to be more for the, the the cluster admins or someone just trying to take a quick peek under the hood of, of you know of that utilization info like a taskman top or netstat something like that it's reporting at that low rate that i mentioned right like often one hertz or something of that sort uh and it's uh sensible for observing reacting and you know usually is incredibly low overhead and uh the numbers are very smoothed out at that point. The um, you know it's it's it, it can be good for for tracking and understanding if a job has some major issues like it's just you know low utilization overall. But the profiler really is is focusing somewhere different. It's to aid the the programmers in optimizing the program. And so the you know the the, the users there are really the engineers typically uh, or occasionally data scientists as well. Uh, it, you know where they have control over such things. And and there's you know once again even different levels of profilers. Uh, so it's then to relate that back to to their their code or their DNN layers and uh, uh, try to then be able to optimize their work so that they can get a more efficient run the, the next time through. Uh, so the the profiler uh, driven optimization workflow right is typically you're running your app under the profiler possibly one or multiple times depending on your settings and and uh, the trade-offs there uh, you'll be analyzing the results and then taking action and optimizing your code or your DNN and iterating until you hit the desired performance uh, insight, uh is actually a family of tools um and so we have multiple profilers as well as other uh products to debuggers and things like that so for profiling though we suggest people start at insight systems which is our you know comprehensive work 
you know, workload level analysis of what's happening on the CPU, GPU, uh, even, you know, NVIDIA, uh, uh, NICs and, and DPUs. Uh, and that's where you understand how everything is balanced and really can get a clearer picture of where your bottlenecks are. And if you then see that you're that you have a, a kernel that's incredibly long, that's when you would switch to and say compute uh, and go and optimize that CUDA kernel to, to understand why that's being long. But sometimes people just will take the assumption and you know assume that it's the GPU uh, uh, because it just seems sensible, jump in with and say compute do an optimization and then wonder, hey, why didn't I get as big of a performance increase as, as I thought? Well, there's turns out to be a bunch of cases that you wouldn't think that may be CPU, GPU interactions making things slow down and you're not actually as GPU bound as you think. And so that's where Insight Systems really comes in and shines. It's the best place to start to, to check all this rather than jumping ahead. Uh, and even to continually go through these loops to go back and make sure that uh, uh, that, that you are uh, hitting your peak performance. So Insight Systems, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show a bunch of pictures because that's gonna help you understand it the most, but it isn't uh, purely, you know, a, a GUI based tool. Um, but zoomed out, and this actually isn't even zoomed out very far, we're looking here at uh, DL model training, just two iterations. Uh, and we're looking at the GPU on the bottom and, or sorry, GPU on top and, and CPU on the bottom and seeing how that work is being launched. And we can get a feel for when the CPU or the GPUs are or aren't working. And things start to look almost like a oscilloscope or something like that, it, you know, here um, uh, where, you know, it's very graphy in, in nature at this zoom level. But we're trying to show, collect and show you a huge amount of information. So what you're actually looking at is a level of detail of, uh, of, of very rich data that is far more detailed than you would see from a monitor. And so if you zoom way in, then that actually transforms into these really rich ranges of you know, when your CUDA kernels are running and what type of operations are happening and when memory is copying back and forth, either across the GPU or between the GPU and CPU and what uh, types of functions are getting executed on the, the CPU as well, just a really rich uh, set of information. So once again, you're seeing this visually, but it's, it's generally uh, mostly also mineable in data. So we're here uh, to help you tune an orchestra of tasks that there's so much going on in your application uh, both in the training part or inference part and everything around it to load the data, to you know, get the output and do something with it. Uh, once again, depending on if you're talking about uh, training phase or inference phase of, uh, uh, of your work, right? Because eventually you need to productize your, your model. Um, and so how do we take, you know, ideally your, you are creating this rich melody and for things to work optimally, there's this great harmony that you've hopefully developed and designed for, and you need to make sure that it's actually matching that. And, you know, no one uh, uh, person there is uh, falling behind or missing a beat or whatever it is that makes everyone else have to wait, right, or ruins the, uh, the, the melody. So why start with NSA systems? It's going to show you that big picture. You're going to be able to see uh, what's happening asynchronously across all your different hardware. You're going to be able to see who's stuck on whom. You're going to be able to take measurements at that high level to, to understand that. And that the previous comment about you know who's stuck on whom is actually really important because oftentimes when you just look at stats, it doesn't give you information about when there is parallelism happening, right? And, uh, and that can be incredibly important to, to know and to decide where the right place to, to make optimizations in your code is. And uh, so, you know, we're trying to avoid uh, people doing work based on intuition and false positives, as I mentioned earlier, and statistics alone just, you know, don't tend to always cut it, uh, or at least that you want to have looked at these profiles occasionally visually 
and make sure that there's not some new pattern that you don't have statistics that can actually capture that, right? So wait, well, why have I gotten this far at this point and barely talked about deep learning, right? Well, deep learning frameworks have their own tools as well, right? And they're, they're kind of doing that domain specific tool. And, uh, you know, they're, they're great. I, I don't have any particular problems with them, but with a tool like Insight Systems, you can go deeper. You can see a lot of that same data. In fact, they are, uh, some of them are based off of either uh, other similar NVIDIA providers or actually based off of Insight Systems themselves and, and maybe using it under the, the hood to collect that data and then give you those statistics. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of problems that you can't solve there. Oftentimes you want to see it, see if then you might want to do something like optimize uh, portions of the DNN, introduce a new uh, uh, layer type, possibly even to optimize the whole thing further into the, you know, into the framework itself. And those, those type of things are only going to be you know, more capturable in Insight Systems. And Insight Systems is also going to show you things like those loading phases in between your DNN layer executions to understand and improve those. So Insight Systems is capturing that relationship between the DNN layers, the CUDA launches, the CUDA kernels being executed. Uh, it can export to SQLite. It has a lot of Python scripts already there for you uh, to base on or extend if you're interested, as well as uh, documentation on, uh, on the database. But uh, SQLite uh, kind of carries its own schema in there. And um, if that's all you want, that's easy. But we're going to go into deeper detail so you can understand that uh, even a little better. Um, yeah. So this would you know, allow you to hopefully better understand the data, improve your statistics, produce your own expert systems to you know, analyze and catch issues that you're potentially looking for. So the, the data, uh, I guess we kind of already saw this. Uh, we have the processes at the top. And the, in, in this view, actually, the, the GPU and the, the CPU work can switch top first bottom on these pictures, depending on what mode the GUI was in, because we can do GPU on top uh, or bottom. Uh, here, we're, we're showing CPU on top. You can see what the threads are doing. Uh, in that little uh, pop out, you can see we're showing you the thread activity, you know, utilization from a zoomed out perspective of roughly how much time the CPU was running or not, uh, the thread state, and uh, uh, even what core it was on. Uh, within those threads, we can do a significant amount of tracing on many APIs. And here we're just showing uh, OpenGL, uh, MVTX, CUDA. And uh, uh, even what the GPU is doing here is a representation of CUDA showing you the kernels and the memory copies and things like that. Uh, with all this, we have sampling information on the CPU side, uh, kind of like perf, uh, where then you can filter it to regions of time and take a look at call stack sampling, top down, bottom up, things of that sort. So with CUDA, uh, you can see uh, this is once again CPU on top and GPU on the bottom, a uh, CUDA launch call and what's getting launched, as well as when it actually ran on the GPU. And this is a nice one where they're really nice and close together, but you can see that that tiny little bit of CPU work uh, triggered this large amount of GPU work. Uh, and the CPU then could move on and work on other things asynchronously rather than having to block on that. And because of that asynchronous model uh, with streams, the GPU can actually get, uh, CPU can get very far ahead and queue things up to the GPU and then wait for it when it wants. And that's actually, you know, while a lot of people think of latency as bad, it, oftentimes it can actually be great, especially for uh, you know hiding uh, hiding bubbles and av avoiding bubbles, waiting for uh, everything to complete because there's too much synchronicity. And when you select on any of these uh, ranges, if they uh, work on both the CPU and GPU, we have correlation here. So you click on one and we highlight all these different little areas to help you understand uh, when it is running 
uh, you know, when and where it's running across the report, where it might be, uh, you know, further to the right, down, maybe to the left, um, whatever it might be. And these arrows will show up as, as well as ruler and row header highlights to let you know where there is something highlighted. We also have MVTX, uh, and this is our tools extensions that let you annotate your own code. And this is a picture from Visual Molecular Dynamics um, where they were able to, uh, to annotate their algorithm and just show really rich detail and get a really good understanding of what the times were spent in which, uh, you know, which areas of their code. Um, and not have to purely rely on the you know, percentages based off of call stack samples, right? Where, where you can't see the, the, the timeline clearly split out like this here. Dan, uh, may I have a question? Yeah. Um, so um, while some frameworks have this profile built in, like for example, PyTorch, what are the key requirements for your script or binary to be able to work within the profiler? And that's from... And Joshua. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that more in a second. Um, but uh, the tool will generally work with, with any of these uh, frameworks, but it's uh, um, there are some features you want to turn on or off to get it to admit some extra information that will make it even more useful. And, and I have some slides on that in a moment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so here with those MVTX annotations that we just talked about, one of the really cool things that, that we do for you is while you emit them on the CPU, we understand the context of what CUDA uh, launches are happening under that, and we can even project these onto the GPU. And so now you're looking at the GPU side of those same annotations. Um, yeah. Oh, stop moving. Okay, there we go. So PyTorch. Uh, so the uh, DNN, oh, did that skip? Okay. Uh, we do have the, to turn on the DNN layer annotations for PyTorch, you need to add uh, the following statement. I believe this evolved at some point in the lifetime of PyTorch, so it'll depend on which version of PyTorch you're using, but it'll be very similar that you would add this around when you go into your training loop, and it would then emit ranges for the, for the DNN layers. And so it would emit sort of like you saw in that last picture, those uh, uh, those ranges on the CPU and we would project it on the GPU. And this also works for, for TensorRT. It's built into TensorRT. So once you get to, to using your model after, not just for training, but uh, to do your inference, uh, you would be able to see that there as well. And we also support um, PyTorch actually has some uh, uh, scripts built in where you can add your own ranges to the code beyond just this emit MVTX that's kind of in the automatic uh, uh, portions of, of the system where you can emit your own ranges around things like file loads and things of that sort. TensorFlow is similar, but slightly opposite, where they default with MVTX to be on inside of the NVIDIA TensorFlow container. Uh, this is not upstreamed. It is uh, uh, Google's choice. They, they didn't, uh, um, they don't have that upstreamed right now. And so you can get it here at these links provided. And then there is this environment variable that if you set this because uh, you want to reduce overhead or whatever it might be, um, you can turn that off. And typically these things are low overhead, but um, uh, it, it's, it's also kind of scalable, right? It's, you know, this is trace. So if you emit, if you emit too many events, then you receive more fixed overhead per event. And so depending on if your batch sizes are really big or really small, you will have a, you know, a different experience there. Um, yeah. Okay. And so doing the API call, uh, or sorry, uh, launching Insight Systems would look something like this. Here's an example command line where we turned on CUDA, MVTX, OS runtime trace, 
you know, KUDNN, Kubla, so many features, right? Uh, even GPU metric sampling. And um, uh, so that's, that's the basics on how you would run it on a box. And then if you were to do this inside of a cluster, it would be something like, you know, S run for Slurm. And, and then you would put, you know, NSYS profile before your, uh, before your app, uh, kind of like above. Um, or similarly, if you were on a single box and you were using something like MPI run, uh, to, to launch your, your work, then you might, uh, uh, do it the other way if you wanted to get a single report instead of a bunch of individual reports. But when you're using Slurm, it's going to distribute it across all the boxes. So you need those individual reports to show up uh, from each of those, uh, you know, for, from each of those, uh, uh, you know, separate creations. So you could bring them back together and, and you know, look at a, a few different reports at a time uh, merged together. So PyTorch Transformer looks something like this. Uh, and you can see a little bit of these, you know, the CPU on the top in this picture and the GPU on the bottom uh, where everything is running. And they even marked out the forward and the backward pass. Uh, there's a little bit of an anomaly here where it turns out that this other work is being done on a second thread. Uh, but you can see how it all fits together in the end then on the GPU. And if we were to zoom in, then you can see even richer detail, right, um, of that with those ranges and exactly what your DNN layers are doing. And, you know, something like this self-attenuation, right, where there's many, many kernels that, that are uh, being launched here uh, underneath that. Daniel, another question. <clears throat> Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so Joshua is asking, currently PyTorch uses uh, with profile activities, is it called profile activity dot CPU, profile activity dot CUDA, record shapes, is it called true as, as prof? Does this by default add the emit NVTX? Yeah, this question is in the chat. Uh, sorry, I'll have to see if I can catch up on that later. I don't know. Uh, I tend to work with other people who are actually doing the runs and I'm not sure of the latest state. And, and they do have their own profiler as well, right? So you, so it, it probably isn't turning it on for their profiler since they're not consuming MVTX. Um, yeah, so I, I, I can't say it definitively. Thank you. Um, all right, so yeah, this picture is those MVTX ranges then projected down onto the GPU. Uh, and I know that the, you know, some of these kernels are just super tiny as you can see here. And uh, this was the eager mode. Um, so, you know, things are a little more spread apart. Um, but yeah, it gives you a really good picture and understanding of, of exactly what might be going on. I think that was from Volta. Uh, and TensorFlow ResNet 50 looks like this. Um, similarly, when those ranges are turned on, so you get a, a really good idea, right, of what's going on, like this, uh, uh, you know, convolution 2D backprop. You can see that there's a lot of different kernels underneath it. And we also support uh, MV Shmem and Nickel, uh, where you can get CPU API annotations uh, for these functions, like you can see the all reduce here, as well as when they're running on the hardware, right? So that would happen, you know, you, you can see a lot of the activity there for something like Nickel, whether it be on a single node or if you're working multi-node, then you can see a certain amount of collaboration uh, um, there and, and an extra thread where some of the networking activity is happening. We can also do this with Dolly if you're working with our uh, data loader for, for images and um, the other data types. And uh, for the core investigation, 
uh, strategy. Um, so a lot of people like to look for what's hot, right? Trying to, uh, you know, just worrying about how to shrink things. But oftentimes that's not always the right strategy. Oftentimes you also wanna look for and understand what's cold, right? Why is the GPU idle? And how can we take advantage of it? It's almost like free money, right? I mean, why spend a huge amount of time trying to shrink something a little bit smaller when there's this big opportunity to run something that where nothing's running? And so that, you know, it doesn't always work out as, as well as you want, but oftentimes when you can take advantage of it, it can be less effort and give you a huge bang for the buck because otherwise that, that you know, that piece of hardware isn't working. Um, so that, that's kind of one of the core things that's really easy to, to spot here and then to start taking actions on, like, you know, how could I maybe start preloading my data sooner so that uh, I don't wait until just when it's needed and then make everyone wait longer for that load to happen. Uh, and then along with that, you can better understand things like the uh, critical path, at least visually, and start to think about how you might shorten some of those hot spots as well. Um, uh, so it's it's both. So the GPU bubble detective is what I like to call it. Um, how I'd often work is take a look at the GPU first and find the scene of the crime, uh, whether or not that be a cold or a cool spot and use the correlation information uh, that we saw earlier to track back to the CPU and uh, uh, better then understand why the CPU took so long to issue that work and to see if anything could be done by refactoring the code to, uh, uh, to get that queued up sooner or make the GPU maybe synchronize less so that it can continue to operate uh, um, more independently and in parallel from the, uh, from the, the CPU. Uh, and with that, then, you know, we're looking at, hey, what's the, you know, what's the thread doing through the samples, what code it's running, depending on if it's C or Python, you may have to annotate. Uh, and then, you know, are the OS runtime functions being called that are locking it up on mutexes and things like that, what APIs are going on, and uh, what are my own user annotations telling me? <clears throat> So that looks like this, right? That the the the, um, the spot on the left is a spot, you know, the box on the left here is a spot where the GPU is just purely empty uh, and no work is happening. And here's a low utilization spot where uh, uh, that just means there's work happening, but very infrequently. And there's a lot of idle time in there. We're just zoomed out to a level where we, we can't even see that idle. And so we have this level of detail scheme that, that I mentioned earlier, where uh, the, the yellow box, the one below, is an expansion of the one above, where when you're zoomed out, it shows you these nice hills and valleys representing the density of work um, uh, for that range of time that that kind of vertical pixel represents. And so it's, it's your cue of saying, zoom in here. And this is GPU metric sampling. Uh, we'll talk a minute about how to interpret that. Um, it can require some advanced permissions and it only happens on, it's only possible on Turing and above uh, GPU. So it won't work on our older uh, Volta in this case, but you can see all sorts of great things here with how your SMs are getting utilized and PCI Express bandwidth and memory bandwidth uh, and even MV links. Uh, and I should point out, I, I had the, the CUDA work at the bottom, so you can see that relationship as well of, you know, yeah, clearly the SMs are active while the kernels are running, and then here's a mem copy, and you can see, you know, high PCI Express uh, uh, bandwidth uh, happening as well, right? Nicely fitting together. So we have the GR active, which is generally whether or not the GPU is doing anything and has work being scheduled uh, either on copy engines or um, the encoders and decoders um, and the SMs as a whole. We have the SM active, which is giving you a percentage of how many of the SMs are active during that period of time. 
uh, to have you understand if the width of the GPU is getting utilized well. We have SM instructions issued, which is uh, very helpful for um, uh, understanding to getting that first hint about whether or not your uh, uh, kernels are designed well, right? Uh, uh, it partly mixes into are your kernel launch grid dimensions good, meaning do you have big enough batches of, of images or audio or whatever it might be that, that you're training on, um, uh, as well as maybe are you, you know, are you designed well for GPU latency, uh, for loads or using caches, things like that. And uh, we can show you if you're using your tensor cores or even the warp occupancy. But the warp occupancy is a really tricky beast. I would not concentrate on that one. I would concentrate more on the uh, instruction issued rate and the SMs active because warp occupancy uh, uh, doesn't have to be full, right? You just need enough warps there purely to cover the latencies of the load and, and things of that sort to, to keep your, your GPU occupied. Uh, and uh, at some point it could, you know, uh, it, it won't help any further, or it could even potentially be diminishing returns versus, you know, utilizing uh, the GPU's SM level uh, shared memory, for instance, right? If, if it's going to sacrifice that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even want to go for, for peak occupancy on, on warps necessarily. But you do want your SMs all active and you want your instructions being issued at a, you know, at a very high rate and you want your tensor cores active, uh, you know, as much as you can. Okay. Uh, note here at the bottom, uh, a lot of these tools can't work at the same time. So you can't be using a monitor like DCGM potentially that might be looking at the tensor core actives at the same time as you're profiling. Uh, and there's also privilege issues where uh, you either make need to make an adjustment to your how your driver is loaded to allow it to work for non-root or you need to to be running sudo because this is looking system-wide at you know at your gpu and so if if anyone can share the gpu at the same time you would be able to see their data as well okay uh, so gpu metric sampling for tensorflow 2 looks like this um, yeah, so you can see uh, uh, you know a few of the MVTX ranges down here, uh, like this convolution 2D, and see what uh, kernels are running, and then into what the metrics are telling you as well. And you can see there's not a lot of tensor core activity happening here, but through all of these incredibly fast uh, um, uh, DNN layers. Right, that there is a much uh, better, um, uh, sorry, up here usage of tensor cores happening on on this uh, GPU. Okay, uh, here's another example with MaskR CNN, uh, and so in this case, you know, you can see that the GPU is quite well utilized up here, but then there's this period of time that someone might want to investigate where that uh, RCNN right is is dropping on its utilization and just can't take full advantage of the the gpu and many of these pictures are intentionally old or intentionally bad examples right so i could show you and point out these things that you might want to spot and, and investigate okay and, and this can even look at uh nickel um and, and you can see inside nickel as it's using mv link uh so that's kind of an interesting property here and uh, we can see two kernels um, at the same time, but uh, this one kernel has to wait for the other one to start because it's an all reduce. So it, it can't do a whole lot of sending uh, before that. And so you, know, you can see how some of that interplay might, might work on the NVLink bandwidth. So for optimization tactics, um, there are settings inside of your DNNs where they might not come by default, depending on if you're taking uh, DNNs that were, you know, models that were already optimized by NVIDIA versus ones that are from other researchers. They may ha not have uh, tweaked those layers to be using tensor cores. They may not have also set everything up for the right uh, conversion or transpose uh, so that the data 
comes in smoothly, in which case you can have weird things happening like you know, extra kernels have uh, there to convert things between different types of tensor formats. Um, you know, a very interesting and important one is, are you providing enough data, right? A, a lot of people start by just saying, all right, just, you know, take one image at a time or one, you know, audio file or whatever it might be, right? One sentence for audio or for, for you know, language processing. Um, and uh, uh, the, the GPU can handle so much info. And if, if, if you don't give it enough info, it can't, it can't keep that GPU full, right? That, that at some point there, there could be some diminishing returns by, by having it smaller. So you want to, to maximize that and give it as much data as, you know, as can fit uh, into that RAM. Um, you can look at things like you know, how good is your parallelism as, as a whole? Are you, you know, using uh, what's there either for Python or C++ with, you know, OpenMP and OpenACC? And, you know, are you loading the data uh, ahead of time, as I mentioned before, because that actually turns out to be the, the most common thing that we spot. It's just that the, you know, a lot of the off the shelf setups are, are waiting until the end of the iteration and then loading the next piece of data when you could have already loaded all of that data, you know, well ahead of time and had it prepared and 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 ready to go straight onto the GPU, so you don't have to uh, have this big gap between each uh, uh, iteration or batch of your um, uh, uh, of your DL um, uh, training. And here then you can look at, hey, what can I maybe reorder or prefetch, you know, things like, are there a bunch of small uh, uh, layers where I could have used a, a, a you know, a different um, approximation or maybe I could swap it out for my own to do some sort of kernel fusion or something like that to get a better utilization if, you know, if I have that time, patience and, and skill to do that. Uh, and in some cases, can I even maybe overlap training or inference to do two at once, uh, which I know, you know, sounds a little crazy, but, um, uh, you know, depending on your case and if you can fit everything into memory that is possible because they can fill each other's gaps on the, the GPU. Um, we can also, you know, you may also, th this one is uh, a little more uh, detailed, so I'm going to skip past this and maybe come back to it. But if you're getting really down in, in the weeds and actually considering optimizing your frameworks and your, your application uh, outside of, you know, of just the standard PyTorch or TensorFlow, right, then you would be looking at things like how can I improve the memory movement and making sure that none of these things are synchronizing or, or you know, getting, uh, uh, you know, implicit synchronizations that weren't expected. Uh, how can I better recycle memory and avoid, uh, you know, many different types of software pitfalls that might happen uh, for a normal uh, CUDA developer that they, they might have these uh, things in their mind. Okay, uh, so there is this great AWS blog post uh, that I would recommend um, people taking a look at that I think you know would let you go deeper. Where they they optimized a deep set to achieve uh, almost a four x speed up and nearly a thirteen x cost reduction for their training of of natural language processing models. Uh, by doing a you know series of improvements, and I think this was their picture of their starting point. Uh, you know, identifying low utilization and areas where nothing was happening, or where there was a lot of memory copies and you know little or no overlapped compute, uh, and uh, you know they went from there to to see how they could do better. So here's the the link uh, and the cliff notes is the as you saw in the picture there was heavy usage of Nsight systems. Uh, they switched from the classic uh, data parallel to the distributed data parallel that, that allowed uh, the different nodes to load their data uh, independently. Uh, they enabled much larger batch sizes and switched to automatic mixed precision. And uh, they introduced a new uh, data loader, at least for their system, called the Streaming Data Silo, 
and you know you can use things like Dolly as well to help here uh, to prefetch the uh, prefetch the data and process it you know in the background or in between uh, to to be more efficient. So uh, I'll quickly run through some of these uh, uh, optimization kind of examples of things that you can spot. This might be a fusion opportunity where you see these you know, small sparse kernels that are more expensive to launch on the CPU than actually to run on the GPU. And you might then investigate, how can I write a single kernel to merge these together, right? If you were to spot a situation like this. Uh, either that or, you know, how would I increase my batch size so that hopefully these tiny kernels increase to something that, you know, makes more sense and is properly loading everything. Uh, here's an interesting one where uh, someone was doing a memory copy from pageable memory, in which case this memory copy that says it's asynchronous turned out to have to wait until this kernel finished before it could do this tiny little copy at the end because the uh, uh, because the software has to realize that the data, you know, that the operating system could have moved that data and it, it couldn't actually do the memory copy then asynchronously. So you would then switch to something like pinned memory, which is, you know, host alloc. Uh, here's another one where uh, they were calling uh, stream synchronize in between almost every single piece of work. And as a result, you need to wait for the GPU to finish and for the CPU then to register that before it will even allow that thread to move along to the next thing. And then, of course, the memory copy happens. And once again, they're synchronizing. So these bubbles start to appear where these two could have been much closer together because there was nothing on the CPU that really needed to be copied in this case. In fact, we know because it was a device to device copy, not even interacting with the CPU. Okay. Uh, operating system side of things. So we have uh, CPU thread state, core occupancy, um, call stack periodic sampling. You need to make some adjustments to your paranoia level. Um, just like Linux perf. Uh, if you're using containers, you may have to change the sec comp to not block this, uh, uh, this operation. Uh, so you can you know, run NSYS or perf for that matter in the container. Um, and there are, uh, uh, that can be done if done through the paranoid level and whatnot, you wouldn't have to do sudo, but otherwise you have to give it higher level permissions. And similarly for ftrace, it has to be uh, admin or you have to modify the permissions of the nodes on the system to support uh, ftracing. And here's some helpful links to, uh, to get you started with those. And so with that, uh, we can do things like OS runtime trace and you can see this was mask our CNN where all the function, all the threads were going into a uh, M map at the same time, and the kernel could only process one to change the memory address space of this process. And so everyone stalled uh, and it couldn't finish all the, the, the maps uh, in, in time because another one off screen was kind of locking it all up. Uh, here's ftrace where you can see things like interrupts happening. An example of the uh, call stack sampling where you can see during a selected range of time or the whole period what your call stack looked like, what your percentages were in breakdown. Uh, and this is the picture of bottom up. Uh, we also have top down and sort of a flat view that lets you see how long things are on the stack, regardless of whether or not the PC was right there. Um, statistics. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the images are good, but at some point in time, you don't want to measure everything graphically and uh, you want to do things like, uh, uh, you know, in DL rank uh, data processing and balances to figure out, you know, which rank is finishing first, uh, you know, which one's last and try to understand what that is. So detecting things like, 
you know, if there's a hurry up and wait scenario where everyone has, you know, it's stuck waiting at the end for these few guys stuck in the mud. Um, and, you know, try to understand the iteration processing time or the, that individual breakdown and look for things like remedies, like uh, uh, does it turn out that, you know, in a sea of PNGs that are fast, there turns out to be one JPEG that was really slow to load, right? You could you know, do those type of investigations and you can attempt to even then rebalance your batches to try to make them uh, uh, more consistent uh, across all of the GPUs or uh, across all of the nodes. And so we can see uh, CUDA kernel summaries such as this. Uh, you know, which would show you your min-max average for any particular uh, kernel. Uh, your MVTX ranges, this is just an example from TensorRT, but I use it because it's actually showing you DNN, um, you know, networks for timing for inference. Um, but you could do similar ones off of, uh, you know, PyTorch and um, uh, TensorFlow, obviously. And these are just the ones we give you out of the box. So, you know, you can obviously do a lot deeper. And we also have these generally integrated in the GUI as well, uh, in the same place that we have that, um, those CPU call stack samples. Uh, if you click on this, uh, where it defaults the event view that would let you see row data or, or those others, you can also go to statistics. And then on the cluster side, uh, multi-node, uh, well, a lot of dealing with multi-node is make sure that your single node runs well first, right? You know, don't just jump into multi-node because it, it's difficult. You're locking up a lot of machines. Uh, you know, the, the way to do it is, is to say, you know, I know that when I run multi-node, here's what my batch size is going to be. And now let me do that, that same amount on a single node so that I know how many uh, you know, sentences or whatever it's going to be are passed, you know, in batch to my GPUs to process so that it will be a close approximation of that. Um, all right. So for working with cluster, uh, I kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, you would you know, use something like S run, you know, whatever yours might be, but then Insight systems inside of that and then your application and that would then produce one report per uh, uh, you know, per rank uh, or task, I guess, for Slurm is the right term. Uh, and when you give it the output, you give it some sort of friendly name, but you'd probably want to incorporate, since you're likely going to a network-based shared storage, you're going to probably want to give it your node ID and your rank or process ID uh, there as well. And you can do other interesting things as well, you know, that would be encouraged, like understanding the local ID and saying maybe GPU metric sampling is recorded from all, uh, all the GPUs just off of that first rank, if it can see all the GPUs in your, uh, you know, in your scheduler or similarly for the NICs where, um, you know, we just say, turn it on. Uh, and that's the, the NICs metrics are, are only for NVIDIA hardware. Uh, for NVIDIA NIC so that they won't currently work with um, uh, you know, other vendors uh, at the moment. Um, okay. Uh, we also advise that you, you know, keep the total amount of record time low. Uh, 30 seconds to a minute tends to be more than enough information to understand what the heck's going on. And you're seeing many, many iterations typically uh, at that right, or batches, depending on what term you're familiar with using. Okay. Uh, when you end up with all those, those different reports from SRUN or whatever it might be, then you can load those on the system. I apologize, I realized this picture is out of date, uh, depending on what version you're using. We used to have a add report up here to open up the first one and add another one to it. Now, instead, you can just say open and select um, uh, you know, the two or three reports you want to see merged together, and it will then ask you, did you want to see those merged or as separate tabs? Wall clock time is an important thing to uh, at least realize the, the impact. Uh, we are recording the wall clock time, 
And so your nodes should be well synchronized. If you're only using NTP in your cluster, then unfortunately you're going to have like uh, you know one millisecond of accuracy. And if you're using PTP, then you know if it's the software-based one, then you can get closer to you know 100 microseconds. But if you're using a you know a hardware uh, solution, then you can get it you know really precise uh, to line those up uh, across um, uh, you know when when looking at multiple reports at the same time. And when doing data analysis here, um, you know, obviously it becomes even more important to not want to look at each file individually because you potentially have thousands of them or hundreds at this point. Uh, and you want to, you know, be scripting and doing data analysis um, to understand which iterations are taking long, which you know, nodes or ranks are uh, falling behind uh, and maybe, uh, you know, doing more time to get through the forward or backward pass before then the, the sort of all reduce phases. And you, you want to do that kind of analysis. And we have a, a link here at the bottom to a, a great presentation that was given a, a few years back uh, about uh, um, specifically looking at uh, Transformer and PyTorch and, uh, you know, trying to understand how to analyze that data for scaling a multi-node. And so you would be looking at those imbalances kind of like we talked about even before with that picture where I was mentioning hurry up and wait and the people kind of stuck in the mud, right? Uh, where you want to then try to make you know every rank more consistent and look at how you might balance that out. Uh, and you know, fix your data or balance your data so that if you understand the amount of processing time for loading or even processing of any particular um, type of image or sentence, right? Sentence can be definitely variable length, you know, causing uh, different behaviors there. Uh, then uh, you can uh, go back and attempt to tune or rebalance so that you're putting in, you know, batches uh, of roughly equal processing length to improve your future iterations of training as you potentially you know retrain over and over uh, as you enhance your uh, your model all right uh that uh i believe brings us to the end yeah um and here uh so it is potentially already on your your cluster <laughs> and uh uh, uh, you can take a look at what's there. Otherwise, if uh, uh, if you are downloading it and adding it to your container or working locally on your system, then uh, this link will take you to the latest and the greatest. And the website version here is typically uh, a little bit ahead even of the version that comes in the CUDA toolkit because the one in the CUDA toolkit can, you know, it, it can take a while for that to lock down and for all the different components to, uh, you know, harmonize uh, before it comes out the door. Uh, but we are then taking the website version and checking it against the, uh, the release and making sure that it uh, uh, works. So it, it will work with multiple versions of the CUDA toolkit. Um, so it's usually pretty safe to, to play with the latest, and then you get the, the latest and greatest features as a result. 